fond of Python internals, storage, and file system. Please welcome Mr. Chetan and Vishal. Thanks, Shiva. <laughs> I think we'll have to bear it uh, with this kind of distraction in between. Okay. Um, so let me start this talk uh, by introducing ourselves. And uh, here we are once again. So the topic of our discussion today is async uh, programming and Python. So based on our experience, uh, we have an understanding that uh, async programming requires a slightly different, different uh, programming mindset. And uh, the main objective of this discussion today is to understand what's at the crux of async programming, what are the different uh, async programming constructs, and uh, how they relate or gel with Python. Uh, we are going to talk about a couple of modules of Python uh, which uh, support async programming. And uh, since it's a slightly vast or a exhaustive topic, uh, we would prefer this to have a have an open discussion on this. Yeah. So let us start with some basics. So any programming task can be either I/O bound or a CPU bound. So when I say I/O bound, it can be waiting for a raw input or a file I/O operation or a network operation or making a HTTP call. It's uh, pretty simple and clear. Uh, CPU bound task can be a uh, humongous calculation in memory task like uh, calculating factorial of 1 million or if somebody who is familiar with uh, video processing a uh, transcoding video transcoding is a very CPU intensive task but uh, what's up with this IO tasks so uh, are you really sure when you do a IO task uh, like uh, I can say that this task can be completed in X amount of time we are never sure about that what if that particular raw input that we are looking for never comes in? Uh, what if the bandwidth uh, of our computer is less that the HTTP call takes too long a time? So we are kind of not sure. And uh, let's take uh, understand this concept slightly better with an example. So let's say I import a, a very famous uh, module called request and I make a get call on google.co.in. And uh, let's say hypothetically my bandwidth available to me is 1 bytes per second. So uh, won't that take uh, too long a time? Yes. And uh, if that's my only task in the web app that I have built, um, God forbid, I don't know what will happen to that. Uh, I think only way of looking at it is I can go ahead and have a holiday and come back. And then the task will be done. But uh, can, we, can we think of a model where we can do certain things in a concurrent way? While one I.O. task is being done, can I do go ahead and do uh, any other I.O. task? Obviously, your uh, application, web application, or any other program that you build will not have only one blocking I.O. task. It can have multiple I.O. tasks. So while one is ha happening, can we do something uh, better in, a, in that time frame? And or can we run any other I/O task in that time frame concurrently? Is the thought process, and this is what is called as non-blocking or async programming. So, as per theory, non-blocking is nothing but essentially uh, making the ability to make continuous progress. I mean, let's not stall, let's not get blocked, let's make progress continuously. Kuch na kuch chalte rehna chahiye. That kind of attitude. And uh, with blocking task, uh, let's say the example that we took in the previous slide, uh, all my resources, CPU, memory, are getting blocked on a particular I/O task. So there is a monopoly kind of uh, mechanism that is created here. So non-blocking paradigm uh, forces me not to do that. Also, uh, when we take care of these things, it gives us better, uh, I mean, lower latency or can give me a higher throughput or if it is a web application that I am developing, it will help me build more responsive web apps. So now I think it's a good time to know what are the th three different uh, programming models we are targeting here. So first of all, synchronous model, uh, very easy to understand. I have three tasks. Uh, once the task one is done, only then will I move to task two. And the task two is done, only then I'll move to task three. So it happens in a serial way. And the total time taken would be the 
summation of individual time taken by each of these tasks. Threaded model, I try to create multiple threads and try to get uh, uh, these things done in a parallel way. Of course, in Python, we have certain <laughs> issues there. Uh, but this is more of a, a, a programming uh, understanding rather than relating to Python. And asynchronous model, why not interleave concurrent tasks and get the desired uh, availability of, I mean, uh, uh, capability of executing parallel IO, uh, IO tasks. So just to take an example, in a mathematical way, I'm making a HTTP call to uh, this domain. And let's say this is the same task, and I call it task 1, task 2, task 3. So in a synchronous model, the total time taken would be 1.2 second. In a threaded and in a asynchronous model, the total time taken would be a slightly better, I mean slightly lower. So what's the magic here? I mean, what's happening here? Uh, so let's go a bit uh, detailed in this. So any uh, web framework that you have worked on, maybe a Twisted or Tornado or any async uh, module that you have worked on, uh, essentially works on this uh, uh, paradigm or this fundamental. So here, uh, this event-driven web server is the Tornado or a Twisted uh, web server. And uh, whenever there is a request from the client, this event web server uh, is responsible for handling this request and uh, sending it back to the IO loop. The IO loop is responsible for handling the event and sending back to the event handlers that it has been designed for. So uh, if you go one level uh, advanced, so IO loop is nothing but a design pattern in itself. It's uh, based on the reactor design pattern. So the reactor pattern tells that uh, it, it's used in every non-blocking framework and works on a philosophy of a single threaded loop. So this is nothing but a single threaded loop, which is waiting on events. And as soon as we have the events uh, being uh, come up, we handle them with the default uh, event handlers, as we talked in the previous slide. But uh, who is monitoring for events, and where does it happen? So let's so uh, let's say I develop a web application using Tornado Web Framework or Twisted Web Framework, and in my application, I am making certain I/O calls, uh, four to five I/O calls, and uh, for every I/O call that I make, I create a socket and a file descriptor is associated with each socket. So when I develop my application, I tell the framework, Tornado or any web, fr web framework, uh, this is the file descriptor that I, I have. So why don't you monitor these file descriptors for me? So Tornado, in essential, will maintain a list of file descriptors, uh, events to monitor, and the associated event handlers for each of these events. But who is exactly monitoring these events or monitoring the FDs for event? That is a kernel level construct. So there are different libraries in different, uh, uh, I mean, operating system flavors. So KQ is used in, I think, Mac OS, and Select is using in Linux. So these are some kernel level libraries that uh, provide event notification in non-blocking way. And uh, what are the events exactly? Uh, so event epoll watches for file descriptors and returns the required events, which are read, write, and error. So now that we are uh, kind of good in understanding what's the async uh, programming way and what lies at the crux of it, uh, let us now uh, associate this understanding uh, to the some constructs that are available in Python uh, with Vishal. Thank you, Chetan. So now we know basics of async IO. So, uh, uh, so async way uh, we can summarize as uh, it is good for applications where you have a lot of IO tasks that are happening, and those IO tasks would be running in an interleaved manner. All of those tasks are supposed to be independent. If they are not independent, we cannot run them concurrently. So we have essentially a single thread of execution where all the, thra uh, all the tasks are run uh, one by one. And they are suspended and resumed periodically by the event loop, as we uh, learned in the uh, uh, reactor pattern. So benefits of async IO is you don't need more resources, and the program is is quite simple. Um, then your IO task won't block. I, even if it is blocked, the whole application doesn't stall at all. So things are progressing all the time. So uh, food for thought for all of you uh, with async IO, can we solve one of the 
perennial problem in Python called Jill. Just keep thinking about it. So let's understand um, how async IO programming is available in Python. So Python has web framework as well as uh, programming module uh, for applications. So we will uh, start discussion with async IO module. So async IO is part of standard Python distribution now. It has been uh, released latest uh, in, I think, uh, early this year. And uh, applications uh, are backward in incompatible with async IO because it's available only for Python 3.4 onwards. So async IO is a completely new way to write your Python applications. You need to think uh, things from scratch. You need to learn what are the constructs available in async IO module and how to write your application using those constructs. So async IO is essentially the same as we learned in the uh, async paradigm. It gives you a single thread of execution. That thread would be handling uh, multiple events. Each event is actually a task. Uh, so to run those tasks, it uses cooperative scheduling. So it's a fancy term for just suspending something in progress. So if you find that a task is stalling the application, it will suspend itself. And when the event is done, it will be again resumed. So in the meanwhile, we can run another task. Uh, so the calls like select epoll, all these calls are wrapped in a library called libevent. So this library is common for Windows and Linux. Uh, and the underlying implementation is different for both the operating systems. So async IO internals, so these are the major components of async IO module. Uh, we will understand them one by one. So let's start with event loop. So as we know that it's a single thread. So this thread would be responsible for running your application. Um, so the major responsibilities of uh, event loop in async IO is uh, to schedule a task. Uh, you can register callbacks. It can handle signals. It can uh, allow creation of transport and connections as well as it provides an interface to thread pool in case you know that a task is going to take a lot of time, so you don't want to run that task in your event loop, you can offload that task to a thread pool. <coughs> Next is a coroutine. So we all know a normal function in Python. So a function is just a bunch of lines of code that runs serially one by one. Coroutines are special functions wherein you can suspend execution of your function at will and resume it as, as soon as the particular event is done. So say uh, in the beginning we had an example wherein we are reading a data uh, from a socket and if that call takes a lot of time, in that case we can suspend the execution, allow some other tasks to run and when the data is available we can resume the execution of our function. So coroutines are decorated by asyncio.coroutine. That's a keyword. And in, in asyncio, coroutines would essentially have a yield from statement. So we'll learn about it uh, in, in an example. So third imp important construct is a task. So coroutines are run by a task. They are wrapped in a task and then put in the event loop. Event loop will sh uh, will schedule the task. And if a coroutine suspends, so task will allow another task to run. And as soon as the coroutine resumes, it will pull the task in the uh, event loop. So actually, in async IO, the event loop employs two queues. So these queues correspond to two different uh, category of tasks. So at any point of time of your, ex uh, of your application while it's executing, you have tasks that are either ready to run or that are blocked on some event. So tasks that can be run immediately are kept in the ready queue. And if we find that a task is about to block, then it will be moved to a suspended task queue. 
to uh, if you want to create a task in asyncio you just have to call either uh, the async function or you can call a create task function it has been added recently in python 3.4 now since uh, io is essentially an operation for which the result is available in future so futures are unresolved references wherein we don't know when the result will be available it could be a value it could be an exception anything so here we have an example so uh, we create an event loop with get event loop call and uh, we create a future object uh, we uh, async io dot async will uh, it will uh, here you can see so async io dot async so async io dot async will create a task that task is actually running a coroutine called slow operation and we have a yield from statement here so as soon as and uh, uh, the future object is called as an argument to the coroutine and uh, we see that future dot add done so as soon as the future is available we will call a callback called got result now let's go to the coroutine slow operation here as soon as the execution of the coroutine starts we sleep so whenever we uh, as soon as we sleep the coroutine is suspended after a second it is resumed and the future is set so uh, when the future is set we call the callback got result so we print the result and we stop the loop so this is a very basic uh, example of async io uh, it almost uses all the constructs we have uh, learned so far there are more construct called transport and protocols so the majority of your work will be done in these construct so transports are a way f uh, uh, to connect so you have sockets you have pipes you have ssl connections and uh, um, protocols are just applications so async io gives you wrappers which are non blocking for various uh, various type of calls like socket creation reading writing uh, from the socket uh, let's understand uh, async io in uh, detail with one more example here we see uh, we create one event loop and we create two tasks uh, so these two tasks are using the same coroutine here we see there are three tasks which i'm uh, three blocking calls so these calls are supposed to run serially one by one but as soon as we cre create a task one with channel one and the execution of the coroutine starts the yield from statement in the beginning of the coroutine suspended so while it is suspended the another task can begin and it will start its its execution so whenever uh, the the connection is created the coroutine is uh, resumed and it will move to the next statement the best way to understand yield from is to just ignore them so that's what guido has told so you don't have to look at them just ignore them and just believe that it is running synchronously one by one so one more thing to add here is like uh, even though these two tasks are uh, asynchronous but uh, we need the operations that are under my subscriber those are synchronous because the first one should complete only then the second would make more sense but in itself these operations are again async so that is one important thing uh, to note here in this case yeah so we have one more example so we create an event loop so event loop is a must for any async io application so in this loop we create three tasks which is a combination of io and cpu task so all three tasks would be running can currently so good thing with async io is you do, you don't need a very high fi machine to run your application even even with a single core and uh, without uh, more memory you can run your application efficiently so as soon as all the tasks are done we will wait till all of them are complete and as they are complete we'll close the loop so this is uh, 
uh, an interaction with AsyncIO module in Python. Now I would uh, hand over to Chetan to uh, help us understand the web framework, which is async, and it's called Panado. So Chetan. Thanks, Vishal. So all the concepts that we learned till now, uh, like in async paradigms or with async IO, uh, all the same uh, are at the heart of any asynchronous library. So if you learn about the basics, you can implement it anywhere. That's the philosophy that we have. So a similar thing can be done for Tornado as well. So the event loop uh, that we started with uh, is implemented in Tornado with I I loop class. The coroutines are implemented with the uh, gen dot coroutine classes, and uh, future is uh, implemented with the uh, concurrent dot future. And again, as we shall mention, the transports and the protocols that we have in async IO. Similarly, similar constructs we have in Tornado as well, and those are implemented in IO stream. So let us take a very basic example of Tornado async. So here in this case, uh, we create a object called HTTP client, which is nothing but async HTTP client library of Tornado. And we make a call to uh, this domain and uh, we print something. So whenever the event loop starts, right, it will come up and first see that there is uh, some async call happening. So it will just uh, handle it to the event, give it to the event handler or the callback called handle underscore request and prints the before event loop starts. So the output here would be interesting to understand. So it prints before event loop starts. That's because the IO task is uh, made asynchronous and only when the result is available will the callback take the event and go ahead and print the success and the response body or error, whatever the case may be. So uh, again, uh, how are core routines implemented in Tornado? So uh, in AsyncIO, we use the decorator at asyncio.coroutine. Similar decorator we have in Tornado, which is tornado.gen.coroutine. And uh, one thing to note here would be is instead of yield from, uh, we are using yield keyword. So uh, yeah, so this is the yield. So in asyncio, we had yield from. So that returns a generator. Here in this case, it results of one of the values of the generator. So and uh, response variable here is a future. So only when the google.com response from google.com is available will that value be filled in the response variable. So it's sim again similar to what we have in asyncio. And uh, as uh, we shall also give an example of creating our own task, in Tornado also we can create our own task. Again, the same paradigm. It's just that we wrap it under another decorator, gen.engine, and we create a synchronous task with gen.task. So we can also create our own future, <laughs> slightly ph philosophical, how can create our future, but yeah. So the server side code is similar to what we had seen two slides uh, behind. So we again take a async uh, HTTP object and then make a fetch call to google.com. But in this case, uh, async HTTP class is written by our own, in our own language, which is myfuture.py and we wrap it around decorator return underscore future. So it prints essentially in my fetch and then uh, returns you a callback. So callback here is nothing but a function test which will print in test and the argument. So argument here would be the uh, date time stamp that gets printed. So it's nothing, uh, I mean, uh, difficult to understand here. It's the same philosophy. It's just that in async I you do it in a slightly different way or as syntax is different. In Tornado you do it in a different way. But the underlying philosophy is same. That's what is the most important thing uh, for us to understand here. So we did some uh, performance tests as well. So it's is this, uh, no coroutine or anything here. It's a simple program. So the bl blocking class uh, takes a HTTP request, which is a synchronous library call, and makes a call to slash work URL. And uh, async makes a uh, async HTTP object and makes a call to slash work. But what is slash work? Slash work is nothing but uh, a construct that is added to IO loop, and it waits for 0.5 seconds. So here are some of the results uh, that we got through the Apache bench test mark. So uh, we found out that async uh, paradigm helps you uh, relate to more requests per second and the time taken per request is also lower. So those are some of the results that we got. So 
uh, let's conclude this session uh, with the learnings that we have so we both believe uh, vishal and i we believe that async program is easy to understand maybe the mindset that we have to uh, build is slightly different it's not with same similar to the conventional programming approach uh, it it uh, python has a new model async io which is quite uh, extensive can be easily utilized and uh, yeah uh, if you use async you uh, get good performance uh, improvements responsive web applications can be built easily uh, the recommendations that we have is of course uh, async is not a har mar ki ek dawa kind of approach so it's not a holistic solution to all problems uh, you need to understand and use uh, these philosophies and uh, you can also look at other uh, paradigms such as multi threading or uh, eventlets uh are there are some new languages that have come up like go and scala that uh, provide for concurrency modules so yeah uh, with this would like to conclude the talk uh there's some references that we used for the talk and uh, you can contact us here thanks okay so let's have some discussion if you guys have Uh, you have spoken about a couple of frameworks that's tornado and uh, twisted now used to twist extensively but i don't know what you know, the difference between tornado and twisted so that's the whole uh, yeah so uh, just to repeat the question what's the difference between uh, tornado and twisted in an async okay. async context so uh, as we understand that we haven't used it twisted uh, extensively Uh, we have used tornado and somebody would have used uh, tornado i mean twisted extensively but our philosophy of this talk is if you understand the basics like what are the different paradigms that we are working on it it's not difficult for us to learn the other one as well yeah so yeah so async programming as we said re requires a different programming mindset so that happens it's true for node js as well it's true for python as well so if you go call back can there call back can there call back that way you get complicated in your own thing but the thinking should be clear and design should be clear i think these problems are best solved in the design mode itself else you end up using promises in node js and all <laughs> right So repeat, to repeat the question, we have two concerns here: uh, chaining of core routines, as I understand. Okay, and then the second question was, uh, uh, okay, then. Ha, huh, call from thread uh, uh, related to the CPU operations. So async uh, I/O programming uh, does provide uh, certain uh, uh, chaining of callbacks, as you can say. So the example that we had published uh, with the subscriber thing. So as uh, I told, uh, like even though the task may be asynchronous, all these three operations are performed in synchronous way. But individually, these operations are asynchronous. So we can go ahead and create, a, go inside and inside and create chain of callbacks as well. So that is available. And uh, relation to CPU, uh, C, C, how is CPU handled in uh, uh, the event loop? Oh, call from thread. Oh, I didn't realize that. Uh, 
इसके ऊपर उसको समझ लेंगे आई थिंक वॉट वॉज योर क्वेश्चन ओके यू कैन यूज इट रेड पुल फॉर दैट जील का प्रॉब्लम सी वेन यू आर रनिंग सी पी यू टास्क वाई वुड यू वॉन्ट टू ईल्ड वाई वुड यू वॉन्ट टू ईल्ड आई मीन द एसिंग का यो इज प्राइमरिली द यूज केस येस इट्स ओनली फॉर आई विन एप्लीकेशन you can okay <laughs> okay uh, we are not aware of it then no yeah multiple simple I think threads, such a strange switch. That is not possible in this case. No, no. You only have seen that you have to make a thread on it. Have you heard something else? Okay. Any other question? question? Oh yeah, please. Uh, I. Couple of libraries are available to connect to databases. Okay. So these libraries are blocking my work. Okay. So, so what is the provision to do for uh, less than uh, Python version, less than 3.0? So, is there any uh, anything we have so that we can avoid the problem? Yes, for earlier Python versions, you can either use async core. So th there is another module. So actually, async IO is a refinement of uh, older modules like twisted, eventlets, uh, async core, async check. So if you want to do async operations for old Python versions, you can try any of them. Did I answer your question? Or also, let's say uh, your uh, question of database, right? So uh, let's say uh, if uh, the framework like Tornado. we have certain async libraries for database operation so that can be leveraged so in this case uh, if you want to interact with mongodb and tornado so mongodb has a module called as motor so motor can be integrated with tornado and then you make everything async so that's another solution that is available so you need not go to async io for that or you need not go to python 3 for that you can still do all these things in python 2.7 Okay thank you thanks thanks a lot guys thank you very much for your time.